All right, good evening, everybody. This is Doug Live with Raleigh Astronomy Club, and welcome to our first indoor meeting. Um, Ann Murphy is our co chair tonight, and Ann will be uh, presenting our speaker. Ann? Good afternoon, everyone. So, a, a couple of announcements. First of all, welcome. Welcome to our hybrid meeting, uh, May 22nd, a hybrid meeting. Um, please be respectful of, of, of everyone, and uh, either if you are Virtual, mute your phone, mute your, your uh, microphone, or if you're here, please please refrain from sidebar conversations. And um, I want to especially welcome uh, first time guests and new club members. Um, a couple of announcements for the people that are here uh, in person. Uh, we have a bathroom key that is on that table over there. Um, we also have hand sanitizer and donuts and drinks if you would like to have any. Um, we are also going to have a raffle um, during the business meeting. Now this is only for people that, um, that are here. So we, we will only have that, it'll be during the business meeting. Um, and get a name tag uh, because that will be, um, we're gonna do that for the raffle as well. Um, and then of course, oh, Mike is gonna show us what we're raffling. Do, do you want to say what these are? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it is uh, this uh, particular book, New Frontiers of Space from Mars to the Edge of the Universe and a Jumel uh, laser collimator. Okay, thank you. And then of course, after the meeting, um, we are going to all eat at Sammy's Tap and Grill, which is at uh, 2235 Avent Bailey Road. Um, so if you're, a, you know, if you've been here for, um, you know, a, a while, you kind of know where that is. So I want to welcome everyone uh, to our first meeting. Now, I would like to present, and he is from the University of Colorado Department of Astrophysics and also at UNC Chapel Hill. So thank you very much. And he's going to talk about the edge. Oh, you. <laughs> okay. Is everything working okay with the mic? I hope. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do this uh, remotely. We have our tech support here. Go ahead and start the first slide. This is a, a, a talk based on some work I did on my year in England where I got thinking about edges of things. We always talk about edges of the universe, edges of the solar system. And I thought, well, we don't have a well-defined way of saying where our, our galaxy end or other galaxies end. So this is based on a year's work in Cambridge, England, some work I published, and I'm gonna show a lot of really pretty, pretty slides. This is an amateur astronomy club, and it's always good to show what we're looking at. <laughs> and then there's only a couple of places where I'm gonna dip into the astrophysics. Uh, we have some professionals here, but I'll try to say it in very simple terms on what I'm meaning, but there will be a few equations. So I apologize for that. Next slide. So I think it was Leibniz that uh, first put the idea out that these fuzzy patches in the sky that we call nebulae were maybe separate from our own galaxy, separate island universes, he called them. And so uh, are they isolated? Are they really separate from the Milky Way? And if you know the history of astronomy, you'll know that back in the 20s, there was a famous debate between Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis and they debated whether these nebulae, the spiral nebulae, were fuzzy patches within our Milky Way or were they outside? And Shapley was a very great man, a great astronomer, but he was on the wrong side. Uh, they really are outside our Milky Way. They are separate, separate collections of billions of stars, literally, and gas and dust, and they're constantly forming new, new stars. And they're all held together, we think, by the same force that holds us on Earth, gravity. So here are, here are just some cartoons along the top. Uh, astronomers classify things the way people classify animals. Um, ellipticals, spirals, and then the catch-all are regular. And on the bottom are, are pictures of those, those elliptical, spiral, and irregular galaxies. And I'll show some, some more coming up. Next slide. In fact, right now. On the left is what we think our Milky Way would look like. 
if we got back into space, maybe a million light years and look back, uh, there is a very bright nucleus in white. And then the spiral arms, which are shown here, they're red because they're glowing in hydrogen light. Hydrogen being the most abundant element out in space. And when you excite hydrogen, it glows in the Balmer line in the red. On the right is an elliptical galaxy. And it's, it's much more fuzzy. It's elliptical in shape. It's got a nucleus, but you'll see a halo, an extended distribution of stars. Uh, we used to think that the main difference between ellipticals and spirals is that spirals are actively forming new stars and ellipticals are not. And that's not quite right, but is a working hypothesis. It, it's not too far from wrong. Uh, we live in a spiral galaxy. The Milky Way is forming maybe two or three new stars every year. And you can see those stars in the spiral arms, the really bright, bright patches. Next slide. So being uh, a Westerner by heart, living in Colorado for 41 years, I used to get up to Wyoming and Montana a lot. You'll see this kind of picture a lot on the web. This one is taken over Devil's Tower in Northeast Wyoming. That's the Milky Way. Uh, and if you could get to a dark sky around here, look at a long photo, you would see something like that. Uh, you, you can't quite see the center of the Milky Way. I'll show that in the next slides. But you can see, you can see a lot of gas. No, go back, please. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, you, you can't see the center, but you can see a lot of the gas clouds. All that dark stuff is interstellar gas and dust clouds. Just like in a smoky room, it blocks the light. OK, now the next slide. Thank you. This is a cartoon that you'll see all over the textbooks. Uh, it's, it takes the place of being able to go out a million light years away and look back. So from a cartoon point of view, looking back at our Milky Way, uh, we live about 27,000 light years out from the galactic center. And astronomers use these funny units of distance, parallax seconds, parsecs. Uh, it's actually about 8.3 parsecs out, but I'm going to try to use light years because it's, it's got a better feel. If you look at the top right, you don't have a feel for what a light year is. It's about six trillion miles. Our nearest star, other than the sun, is Alpha Centauri, and it's about 4.3 light years away. So that would be about 25 trillion miles. It's going to be a long time until humans go there. Even Elon Musk isn't going to get there in his lifetime. Um, okay, we're in a barred spiral, and you can see the spiral arms in this graphic, graphic uh, illustration. If you can read the fine print along the top, vertical and uh, vertical axes, you'll see uh, 60,000 light years at the very top, 70,000, 75,000. So from side to side, the diameter is about 100,000 of these light years across. That's, that's the size of the visible starlight in our Milky Way. And we're a pretty typical spiral galaxy. So typical galaxies like our Milky Way are 100,000 light years across. And we're about a quarter of the way up. We're going around that spiral. And a galactic year is about 210 million Earth years. So we go around, now well, it's about a, a fifth of a billion years. We've been around about 20 times our sun. Next slide. Okay, I said I was going to show you a picture of the galactic center. To see the galactic center, you have to peer through all those dust clouds. Dust is just terrible for, for optical light because the dust particles are about the same wavelength, say, same size as the wavelength of the light. And so they scatter it just like smoke in a, in, a, in a smoky room or a forest fire, and you can't see very far. But if you look in the infrared, as the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to do, and many other telescopes with infrared detectors, you can see the galactic center. And this is the galactic plane of the Milky Way disk. Right down inside there are a lot of star clusters and some very interesting dark object that we're pretty sure is a black hole. And if you were looking at the papers yesterday, you probably saw the news. So I added a slide just for you. Next slide. There it is. That's the image that the so-called Event Horizon Telescope took. This is an international effort, radio telescopes all over the world, all phased up and linked together 
so they can mimic a telescope the size of the Earth. And by doing that, they were able to see not the black hole, the black hole is down there, but the hot gas swirling around before it plunges into the black hole. It's called technically an accretion disk. Accretion meaning sucking in gas. Um, and you can see it's not, not quite ring-like, but it's close. And the light's being bent around a lot by the black hole. There's a shadow where the light goes into the black hole. You can't see any light, it's truly black. So what you're seeing here is outside the black hole, hot, hot gas radiating in the uh, X-ray and radio. Be accreted? We don't really know. It is uh, the other image that they showed a few years ago around M87 was uh, more more symmetric, axially symmetric. We don't know what those are. Um, it could be uh, the bending of light, or it could be just places where the gas is hotter. My my hunch is it might have to do with strong magnetic fields that are getting twisted and and maybe making the radiation. Uh, I just wanted to put a few numbers up on the top if you want to amaze your, your neighbors and friends. Uh, we think the mass of the black hole is about 4 million times the mass of the sun. That's a wimpy black hole for a galaxy. These are typically a billion solar masses. This is only 4 million. Uh, it's 27,000 light years away, so don't worry. None of the radiation is gonna hurt us. And it's not that big. It's just a pinpoint of light. It's about, well, the black hole radius itself right here would be about 8% the size of the Earth's orbit uh, within the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. So if we were to put the Earth on this, the Earth would be right about here at the edge. Okay, so you can think about it. this is very, very far away. It's a very small volume. There's no danger of us falling into that black hole. Okay, uh, next slide. Back to the main talk. I'm gonna be talking about first our Milky Way and the edge of our galaxy. So in this cartoon, you can see at the very center, this visible disk of light that I showed you before. That's 100,000 light years across. That's pretty far. But you can see here that the Milky Way has lots of satellite galaxies going around, probably falling into the gravity of, of this whole dark matter. Um, I've labeled a few of them with bigger prints so you can see how far away we think they are. If you were in the Southern Hemisphere, you could see Sculptor and Fornax, and I'll, I'll show a slide on that soon. Those are 290,000 light years, 460,000 light years. That's getting out there into the halo, much beyond where the visible starlight is. And the Northern Hemisphere, there's a number of them, Draco, Sextons, Ursa Major, two or three, two or 300,000 light years away. But the two most famous satellites, and again, you have to live in the South, South Africa, Australia, South America, the clouds of Magellan, the large and small Magellanic clouds. And again, I'll have pictures in a second, but this is just a, a graphic art. We now have really, really accurate distances to those. And for the astronomers here, it's done by eclipsing binaries, by the timing the binary, uh, and having a model for it, they can get the distance. So we know these distances to the clouds to about one or 2% accuracy, uh, 162,000, 200,000 light years. So already that's twice the size of the visible disk. They're out into the dark halo, orbiting around, uh, coming around the Milky Way. Next slide. There are the large and small Magellanic clouds. And this is one large field picture. Uh, I have another one like this. I love it when you take a wide angle view and you can see two objects in the same field. There's the LMC at the top. There's the SMC, small Magellanic cloud at the bottom. Um, they're about 20 degrees apart on the sky. So normally you would have to move your telescope to get images. They're, they're pretty big. And if you go to the south, you can see them easily with the naked eye. Um, something has changed about our knowledge of these two objects just in the last few years, maybe five years or less. We used to think the LMC and SMC were pretty small compared to the Milky Way, but now we've measured its mass from stars orbiting, it's rotating, and also by its, its gravitational effect on other clusters, 
we now think it's about 10% the mass of the Milky Way, 100 or 200 billion stars. So it's, it's pretty big. The small Magellanic Cloud has also gotten bigger, not in fact, but just in our knowledge. It's about 3% the mass of the Milky Way, uh, 10,000 light years across. LMC is about 28,000. Just uh, in passing, I'll mention that back in 1987, for those of you who were alive then, I was, February 23rd, a star blew up in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and you could see it with the naked eye. I, I got down there to see it. It was, it was really quite amazing. It was called Supernova 1987A, because it was the first one to go off. And it's still visible, uh, not to the naked eye, but visible to telescopes. OK, move on, and I'll show you some other dwarf galaxies. Most of the galaxies moving around our halo are dwarfs uh, of elliptical side, size or spheroidal. Uh, Sculptor and Fornax are both elliptical. And there they are. They're, they're, they look like star clusters, but they're much bigger. Uh, they're also three or 400,000 light years out in the halo. So, uh, northern objects, these are very well photographed objects. The next slide shows one that I'm gonna come back to for a special reason, LEO-1. It, it was not that long ago that it was discovered uh, and, and its distance estimated. Its distance holds the record if it's bound to the Milky Way. We're not sure, it's, it's, it's coming in under the gravity. Uh, if it's bound to the Milky Way, that gives an upper limit to the mass, to pull it in. But it's 250 kiloparsecs, 815,000 light years away. And those of you who are gonna go look for it, I'll just warn you, off here to the right, 12 arc minutes away is the bright star Regulus. So you get caught in the glare sometimes. But you can see that they figured out a way to take a really nice, lovely image of it. Okay, uh, next slide is a cartoon, just to return to what I was telling you. These objects, and these are some of the inner dwarf galaxies, these objects feel the gravity. They're falling into the Milky Way. Some of them for the first time, some of them have been around many times. And these are some that have come in pretty close, 30 kiloparsecs, 20. Remember the sun is at about eight kiloparsecs out. So these are getting in close to the sun and you can see the streams that they're leading, leaving behind them. The gravity of our Milky Way and also now the large Magellanic Cloud is stripping stars out through tides, just like the tides on earth, except it's not water that gets sloshing around, it's stars. So there's, there's a famous stream called the Orphan Stream. They don't really know which galaxy it came from, this cartoon makes it look like it came from Ursa Major, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, the Sagittarius dwarf uh, has a nice stream that we've seen a few years ago. Okay, next slide. This is the fam most famous stream. Uh, I guess in the Southern Hemisphere, but you can see it with radio telescopes. You can see it with Hubble, uh, with Southern telescopes. It's called the Magellanic Stream. There's our large Magellanic Cloud. There's our small Magellanic Cloud. You remember they're out at 160,000 or 200,000 light years. Um, they are forming a lot of stars and that blows gas out when the stars explode. And the gas gets stripped back into this stream. It goes all the way around the southern part of the Milky Way and you can even detect it coming back up. Uh, now we think that this stream is out at something like 50 of these kiloparsecs, or in light years, 162, 160,000 light years. So we're starting to probe the halo now, not just with galaxies, not just with dwarf galaxies, but with the gas and stars that got stripped out of them. Because gravity pulls on both sides to tides, and you can strip out stars and you can strip out gas. Next slide. Okay, this is the last, I think, of the cartoons, just to kind of pull back a little bit more and give you a bigger picture. I had been showing you the Milky Way and its halo. So here's the Milky Way over there. And there are a few of the dwarfs. This is from a textbook for undergrad astronomy. Uh, we have a cloud of probably close to 50 or 60 of these dwarf galaxies orbiting around our Milky Way. The large and small Magellanic clouds are in here. 
There's that Sagittarius dwarf, Fornax. Leo one, I told you I'd come back to that. There it is, way out there, 815,000 light years. It's on its way in for the first time. So whether we call it in the halo or not, it's kind of a somatic point. It's going to be, it's going to come in, swirl around and become part of our Milky Way's halo. Over here is Andromeda. The Andromeda galaxy is our nearest large galaxy neighbor. It's two and a half million light years away. The air bar on that is getting pretty well determined now. Um, and Andromeda and Milky Way are the two largest spiral galaxies in the local group, local galactic group. There's a third, the amateurs of course will know, Triangulum, M33, Messier 33. That's another spiral galaxy. It's not as big as Milky Way or Andromeda. Um, in fact, it's probably gonna be bound to Andromeda. The two of them are on similar paths. But most interestingly, these two galaxies are pulling each other together. They're feeling each other's mutual gravity. They're falling toward each other at about 110 kilometers a second. So several million miles an hour. If you do the math, in about three and a half or four billion years, Andromeda and Milky Way are gonna pass through each other. And stars won't collide. They'll just pass through each other and come back and slosh around. And I, I had a movie, but I'm not gonna be able to show it on this, on this uh, talk, but if you look on the web, you can find movies of what Andromeda and Milky Way are gonna do. Andromeda also has a bunch of dwarf galaxies in its halo. So you can think of these as sort of the, uh, the two, dominant, two dominant beasts of our local group. Uh, I guess you used to say United States and Russia, and now we say United States and China. We're, we're the two hegemons of the local group. We're gonna pass through each other and make one big group in about four or five billion years after everything settles down. So that's our future. In about five billion years, you will no longer talk about separate groups of galaxies and halos around each galaxy. It will just be one big, large group. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. This is that other picture where they can fit two galaxies into one field of view. I love it. Here's M33, the spiral and triangulum, thanks to the hand on there. And up there is M31. And if you look closely, you'll see two satellites around it. Here and here, that's M32 and NGC 205, just catalog numbers. But there are 30 or 40 dwarfs around Andromeda as well. This is not a galaxy. That's a star, it's called Mirach in the Arabic. Uh, it's a foreground star in our Milky Way. It's a red giant. If you want to see this picture, it's the astronomical picture of the day, uh, September 26, 2013. But you can just Google it and probably find it um, if you want to show it off. There's also a lot of haze. You, people always ask, what's all that fuzzy stuff? That's the interstellar gas in between us and the, within our Milky Way, uh, in between us and the galaxies. Oh, and there I said 110 kilometers a second. The two galaxies, M31 and the Milky Way, are moving toward each other. Next slide, please. And there it is, just a close up. A uh, little bit more massive than the Milky Way, probably forming stars at a little more rapid rate. The two big satellites, NGC 205 there, Messier 32 up there. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to move out now just a little bit farther and talk about other groups of galaxies and what that can tell us. Um, I introduced the local group, which is end to end, side to side, probably about three million light years across, two and a half million to Andromeda and add a little bit more for the outskirts. Uh, this is a galaxy called the whale. If you look carefully, you can maybe see flippers here and the head of the whale over there. Very active forming galaxy. Uh, for those of you in the audience, there's gonna be a quiz here. What type is this galaxy? Spiral or elliptical? You can probably classify it irregular, but it, if you look at the details of the starlight and the type of stars, it's actually both. There's clearly a spiral disk right here. 
And you, you can see the gas rotating. And so the center would be down here, but then there's this red light of old stars that has all the attributes of an elliptical galaxy. Probably these galaxies merged. Like I told you, M31, Andromeda, and the Milky Way are gonna collide. Well, they, they've already done it. And there's diffuse hydrogen alpha, Balmer alpha emission up and below uh, the disk. And if I showed you an X-ray picture, you would see hot gas glowing all around this. So this was a puzzle for a long time. Uh, but then thanks to radio astronomy, next slide, we figured out, astronomers figured out what was going on. Martinez Delgado et al. back in 2015. Uh, here's the whale right at the center. And the blue is all radio emission, hydrogen 21 centimeter line, if you know about that line. The hydrogen line uh, has an electron and a proton in the center. And if you can flip the spins of the electron and proton, you radiate 21 centimeter line emission. It's a wonderful line uh, that was first observed back in the 1940s, 1946, I believe. And here you can see what's going on. There's another galaxy down here, and there's another one there. This is in a small group, and the galaxies are passing through each other, and that's why there's all this disturbed morphology and gas in between the galaxies. These two galaxies, as I said, are separated by about 70 kiloparsecs. That's about 250,000 light years. So that's coming into a common scale. You'll hear me talk about two or 300,000 light years. That's a typical scale when the gravity, uh, the tides start to do interesting things, strip gas out and um, make for train wrecks out there. The next slide is one of my favorite groups. Uh, it's called Stefan's Quintet. And some colleagues of mine recently published a paper on it looking at the shock waves. This is all new stars and gas that have been shocked because these galaxies are passing through each other. So if I were to guess what would Andromeda and Milky Way look like in four or five billion years, this is it. You can pick which one is Milky Way and which one is Andromeda, but um, pick one of those two large reddish galaxies. And when we pass through each other, that's what's gonna happen. I've labeled with arrows the tidal tails this gas gets pulled out on this side and that side. I can't reach that high on the top one. Uh, it was discovered, interesting, why, why did it get named Stefan? It was a French astronomer at the Marseille Observatory that discovered it in 1877. We currently think it's about 280 million light years away. And for those of you who know redshifts, it's about 2.2% the speed of light. Z is 0.022. And for those of you who like the Christmas film, It's a Wonderful Life, if you watch in the first few minutes of it, when the angel uh, Clarence comes in, this image appears in Frank Capra's movie. It's in black and white. So next time you see it at Christmas time, uh, look for it. The other interesting thing that we know now that we didn't know then, that top left galaxy is not a part of the group. It's, it's, it's a foreground galaxy, it's much closer. And you might guess that because it's a different color. It's a very active star forming spiral. Uh, it's bluish. It's not full of dust. Okay, so here again, these galaxies are, they're pretty close. They're probably 50 kiloparsecs apart. When you get closer than 50 kiloparsecs or 100 kiloparsecs, you can start to do interesting things to the galaxy by tides, by gravity. Okay, so this is kind of, I think this is the segue point where I start to get into the physics question, astrophysics, of how would we define from the laws of physics, gravity and radiation and, and blowing winds, how would we define how big the galaxy is? Where does it end? Next slide. It's gonna talk about that from a theoretical point of view. And Following this, I would have had a movie that shows how this cosmic web gets started, but I'll just explain it. Oh, I thought you were maybe able to do it, but I don't think there's a way to do it. Not off, of, not off a of PDF, yeah. Okay, so if you if do a computer simulation uh, in an expanding universe and you let gravity pull things together, and most of it, of course, is dark matter, but some of it's gas, 
hydrogen and helium and heavy elements. And you turn gravity loose. What does gravity do? Well, it pulls things together, but nothing is perfectly round. In fact, in this room, we are not distributed uniformly. I mean, there's a group of people here and people here, and it's not perfectly round. And if you all had gravity that was millions of times stronger and were pulling everyone else toward you, what would happen? Well, this group over here would clump up. This group over here would clump up. But then you might start to flatten and get closer together because gravity pulls hardest on the things that are closest to it. So something that's slightly out of round collapses first spherically, then kind of to a pancake. Because the pancake is, everything in the pancake is closer together. And then the pancakes start to pull together in ropes. And that's what we're seeing here, ropes or filaments. So all this cosmic web, looking like kind of a spider web, is what gravity does when it starts pulling on other gravity, other objects. And what you see in color, all these beautiful places where it's in red and orange, that's where the gas is also pulled in, where the filaments cross. The gravity has pulled the matter, ordinary matter in, and formed new stars. So new gas, new galaxies, new stars are where the filaments of this cosmic web stop or cross. And if you could see the movie, and I wish I had it, you would physically see all these little bits here getting pulled in to the cluster. And here, there, and there. So we think this is what happened to our local group. It certainly happened to Stefan's quintet. All these little galaxies, little halos were pulled in and they formed big ones. And then the big ones start to pull in, pull in the dwarfs. So if you think back to the slides of the Milky Way and Andromeda, all those dwarf galaxies in the halo are getting pulled in. So this would be one definition if you wanted to say, okay, where does the galaxy end? Well, you would draw a circle around here maybe, or over here and say, okay, these are all gonna eventually get pulled in and become part of a much big, bigger super galaxy or group or cluster. Here's a question. Yeah. The, the white areas are voids, and yes, uh, everything here is expanding except for uh, the dense parts. The dense parts don't expand with the universe, they, they re collapse. Uh, but the voids, the white patches, will get, get bigger. Now, they're not empty, and that's a whole different talk, a whole different story. Uh, we went out looking with the Hubble telescope oh, 15, 20 years ago and found a lot of gas clouds in the voids, no stars, no galaxies, but gas clouds that eventually could become galaxies. So the voids aren't empty, but they're a lot lower density. Uh, most of the matter, including the dark matter, is, is with the filaments and with those clumps. Okay, skip the next movie, because that's gonna be a blank screen. And yeah, here we go. So this is kind of a summary of what I'm gonna tell you in a few slides, and again, I'll apologize for the few equations, but they're easy and they're easily explained, put it that way. Um, we think doing these physical estimates that the extent of galaxies is something between 500,000 and 800,000 light years or 0.5 to 0.8 million light years in radius. That's, that's a pretty good estimate. And there's a range because galaxies aren't all identical. Those, those physical estimates come in two varieties that I'm gonna walk you through quickly. The first is what I've been talking about mostly, ending by gravity. Where does gravity end? Or where does it stop being the strongest force over the long, long range? And that gives numbers like 200 or 250 kiloparsecs. Um, the, the second type is ending by gas. These galaxies are stripping out gas from tidal effects. They're also blowing matter out in galactic winds, and I'll show you pictures of that. So you can also say, where does the gas stop? How far does the gas go before it, it terminates? And that gives a, a very similar number, uh, maybe slightly smaller. So let me walk you quickly through a couple of slides on the physics behind these, these words. Next slide. I think most people know that the reason we think there's dark matter in, in galaxies is that if there weren't a lot of invisible dark matter to bind the stars and gas together, 
the galaxies fly apart. The stars will go flying off into space. And the rotation speed is called the rotation curve. These are the velocities of lots and lots of stars that astronomers have measured and measured their distances. And this is the so-called flat rotation curve that, that led Vera Rubin in the 1960s to propose there must be invisible or dark matter, not stars, something else. Uh, it's slowly declining, we know now, but if there weren't dark matter, these velocities would come way down, as Kepler's law would tell us, like, like planets in the solar system. But our galaxies are different. Their rotation speeds far out just keep on going. Uh, so there's something out there that it is dark matter. Now we run out of stars at about 65 or 70,000 light years, and you just can't, can't see anything anymore to measure. Next slide. This is the, uh, the two equations that I'm just gonna say in words. There's two ways that physicists or astrophysicists qualify, quantify uh, where gravity ends or where gravity's influence is strong. The first is called the accretion radius. And you'll see an equation R is equal to two GM over the sound speed squared. M is the mass of the galaxy. All that is is saying, when does gravity stronger than the kinetic energy of the gas or stars around it. When you equate those two with the simple law of freshman physics, you've got a number of about 200 kiloparsecs for our galaxy. That mass is in units of a trillion solar masses, which is about the mass of the Milky Way. I think that's all I'll say on that. If you look at another measure based on the velocity of stars, instead of putting the sound speed as a measure of, of the kinetic energy, that you're trying to bind together. You just look at the random velocities of stars, that's this sigma squared, you get a number very similar, almost 200 kiloparsecs. So I think there's pretty agreement, good agreement, that the gravitational strength around a galaxy like the Milky Way, a trillion solar masses, would, would stop being so strong at about 200 kiloparsecs, 700,000 light years. So that's in pretty good agreement with the observations. That's ending by gravity. Next slide is a similar measurement. And this, this is, uh, I'm just showing this to show the movie, or the still of the movie. This is called the virial radius or splashback radius. When the matter comes in, in this cosmic web, it sloshes around and the orbits go back out, they pass, they go back out. And that, that first passage where they come back out here and then turn around and come back in, these are orbital trajectories. That's called the splashback radius, almost like you're going out and splashing and coming back. And that agrees very well, the, the charts on the right are just to show that that agrees very well with those earlier numbers that I gave you, about 200 kiloparsecs. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna switch to the other definition of ending by gas. What we've learned over the last hmm, 30, 40 years, is that uh, all the star formation in our Milky Way and other active galaxies can blow gas out into the intergalactic medium. Galaxies can have winds, just like our sun has a wind. You're blowing matter out. But you've got to have an enough, enough wind velocity, enough kinetic energy to escape the gravity. So gravity is coming back in again in a different way. If you have enough energy to have escape velocity, you'll blow out in between the galaxies and pollute the intergalactic medium. But if you don't have enough, you'll turn around and come back in, sort of like a fountain. In fact, this is often called the galactic fountain. If the gas doesn't blow up, blow out with enough velocity, three or four or 500 kilometers a second, it'll turn around and fall back in. That's good for us because if it falls back in, it'll form new stars and keep the galaxy bright, and looking beautiful. If it blows out to the intergalactic medium, it'll eventually die out, uh, stop forming stars, become red and dead. So this, it, this is also something I want to give you one slide to quantify how far out would this wind go, this left side here. If it blew for a billion years, one giga year, that's a billion years. If it blew at about 200 kilometers a second, which is a typical wind, it would go 200 kiloparsecs. So there's that magic number again. But maybe like the solar wind, maybe it stops. Maybe it runs into gas out in between the galaxies. 
and maybe the wind stops. And the next slide, I think, talks about that. Oh, not quite. This is, this is a very powerful type of wind. It's a radio jet from a central black hole. That, that can go out hundreds of thousands of light years well, as well. That's the Hercules galaxy. Next slide. Yeah, sure. Those uh, two scenarios are the extremes. If you have escape velocity, which is probably for our Milky Way around the sun, about 500 kilometers a second. That's about the speed of a solar wind, by the way. Uh, if you could get the gas blowing out from supernova and exploding stars uh, or a black hole, uh, pushing it out, and you could get it out there, it would have escape velocity. But most galaxies probably aren't blowing that hard. And they're probably doing this. They don't have enough kinetic energy put into their wind. Maybe they did when they were younger. You know, when you're young, you're strong and vigorous. <laughs> when you get old, your wind kind of peters out. Okay, so again, this is more for the pictures to show you what I meant by winds. These are real galaxies. This is Messier 82, which is a starburst galaxy with these two biconical jets flowing up the North Pole and down the South Pole of the galaxy. Uh, that one on the left is another galaxy. Um, the equation up here, I don't want to go through except to say it gives you a number of one or 200 kiloparsecs also. This is the same equation that we use to estimate where the solar wind stops. And those of you who followed Voyager 1 and 2, just in the last couple of years, Voyager passed through that termination shock. It's called the heliopause, where the solar wind runs into the interstellar medium and, and stops. So I have called this the galactopause, not the heliopause. And it's out, uh, those parameters, I'd have to go through them and I'm not gonna bother. It's out at 140 or maybe 200 kiloparsecs, uh, yet to be discovered. That's, that's sort of an open, open question. Okay, so I think we're getting near the end. Let's uh, try the next slide. Yeah, the last, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is other, one other piece of strong evidence that the halos of galaxies are a lot bigger than the visible disk. And that evidence is shown in this cartoon on the top, or image on the top. Uh, if you take a spectrum of a, diff a very, very distant object, a quasar or a distant galaxy with a strong ultraviolet lighthouse, um, as it passes through the halos of galaxies, and there's one there that I show with the arrow, uh, if it passes through the halo and if there's gas in that halo, you'll get an absorption line. And that's what we see down here. All these little dips in the light are intervening gas clouds and galaxy halos along the sight line toward distant quasars. So about uh, 15 years ago, um, astronomers started to really get into this game with Hubble. And I'm gonna show you just some quick results on that on the next slide. This is the same idea with Hubble. We find a quasar and it's got a little bit of offset from the galaxy, so it passes through the halo. There's Hubble down there. And if there's gas that's been blown out there by the wind, you'll get an absorption line. And that top spectrum there shows absorption features where the gas is absorbing the light in the distant quasar. So I won't get into all the details, but it's been seen in hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, silicon, sulfur, all the elements that we love, iron. So you can build new planets, new creatures maybe, out of those elements that have been blown out into intergalactic or circumgalactic space. The next slide is a cartoon that shows pictorially how far out they go. This is like a target bullseye diagram. And each of these diagrams, the quasar, would be at the center of the bullseye. And each one of these squares or triangles is where the galaxy was um, along the line of sight. And you can see that, that out 100 or 150 kiloparsecs, we are still seeing absorption. This was a big surprise. Uh, my former graduate student, Jason Tomlinson, and his team used the cosmic origin spectrograph on Hubble, COS, cosmic origin spectrograph, and basically overnight revolutionized this field. We now know that there's gas out at hundreds of thousands of light years and it's heavy elements. It was made inside stars and blown out into space. 
here it is normalized to the, the gravitational radius, aerial radius. It's way out there. Some of that gas is, is escaping and probably some is coming back in. Okay, last couple slides just to wrap up. This is uh, the famous Hubble Deep Field. Everything in this galaxy, in this image, except for four stars with the spikes, there's one up there, and there's two more for young people with sharp eyes. <laughs> Everything else is a galaxy. Some of them are really far away. This one used to hold the record redshift of seven point something. Not anymore. Redshift record is now around 11 or 12. But everything else is a foreground galaxy. You'll see red ellipticals, um, blue spirals. There's a spiral, there's a spiral. Now these are all suffering from the foreground effect, foreground background. When you take a deep image in this dark part of sky, it's not dark anymore. Some of these galaxies are very far away near the edge of the universe, some are close. They all fill the space in between, but you can see there's still, even with that effect, there's still a lot of empty space in between. It's filled with dark matter halos and gas blown out from the galaxy. And my last slide, I believe, just sums it all up. Uh, what I've tried to convince you is that halos of Milky Way galaxies probably extend out to close to a million light years, a half to 0.8 million light years. The space in between those galaxies is very, very low density, but it's not a vacuum. I can extend my arms about a meter. So a cubic meter in volume, on average, would be a tenth of an atom. You'd have to have 10 cubic meters to have one hydrogen atom. But there's a lot of empty space, and it all adds up, and you can get a lot of, a lot of matter out there. And then finally, most importantly, as we've seen with winds and groups and tides, the influence of galaxies extends way out into the intergalactic medium, and they affect it through their radiation, their wind energy, and what I call chemical feedback, the heavy elements that pollutes the intergalactic medium. And there are two more examples. And that, I think, is the end. Thank you. Will you repeat the question or should I? Uh, so it'll be inside here, and then we'll also take okay. So if it's inside here, I will repeat the question briefly. Okay. Well, actually, I'll catch it here and I'll respond. Oh, okay. Great. Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Both of them. Both of them. That's right. Um, Thank you so much for the talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it. It really got me thinking about those initial sort of classifications you were talking about uh -huh. and what we sort of see just observationally, right? So if if I remember right, so if we're looking at a halo of around 500 to 800,000 light years, things like the Magellanic Clouds are well within that. Yes. Halo, right? right. So then what is the, is, is there a fundamental difference between say a dwarf elliptical ga or a dwarf elliptical galaxy and something like a big globular cluster? Or that so yeah. you know is it is it just traditional classification or are there differences? Why we call one of those galaxies? Yes, no, I'm with you. That's a that's a question that people have been asking just in the last decade. Uh, well, first classification. Comment on that. It's visible visual visible light that we use. If we looked in the infrared light, things would look somewhat different because the types of stars are different. If we could see the dark matter somehow, for example, if it decayed into gamma rays and we could see the gamma rays, it probably would look spheroidal. So classification, which came about in the 1910, 1920, was a very, uh, a very specialized visible, visible classification system. What we've also learned is that galaxies can change shape and, and type. As they collide and pass through each other, uh, probably spirals get disrupted and turn more into ellipticals, the halo, the stars get kicked up onto orbits into the bulge and halo, because what you see in the starlight is really what are the stars doing in their orbits? And if they're all in the disk rotating around, it's a spiral, but if they get kicked up into the halo, it's an elliptical. Now, as the globular clusters, um, there are a number of them that uh, are very, very big, um, 10 to the fifth or even 10 to the sixth solar masses. They're getting up there close to dwarf galaxies, which are maybe 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth and up. Um, most of them are thought not to be dark matter dominated. 
the velocity dispersions, the random motions in the globular uh, are low. So you don't need dark matter to bind them. But there are two recent exceptions. And the famous one is Omega Centauri. And there's another one, 47 Tukani, 47 Tuck for short. Both of those are looking more and more, as astronomers measure velocities and motions, more and more like they might be stripped dwarf galaxies that have come through the halo and gotten stripped. And all we're seeing now is their cores. But probably most of the globular clusters in our halo is about 150 of them are probably uh, not dark matter dominated. They were formed out of molecular gas. So if it's formed independently, it may, probably, it may have dark matter. They, they probably don't have dark matter that they pulled into them. They may have been formed in a tidal trigger. We've seen other galaxies where collisions make these tidal tails and you'll see globular clusters. Well, they're young clusters. They'll become globular clusters. The ones in our galaxy can be age dated from their main sequence turnoff. They're 12, 12 and a half billion years old. They're old. Whereas the young clusters are only maybe a billion years or a few hundred million years old. Yeah. I think this might be kind of along the same lines that question. But when you talk about galaxies ending by gravity at about 700,000 light years, but now you're also saying that Andromeda and our Milky Way are, are gravitationally attracted. Yeah. So the kinetic energy must be less than something. So, so can you, how do you compute that? that right. First thing I should say is um, I, I glossed over something that I need to clarify. Gravity never ends. It's a long range force. It falls off as one over the distance squared, as Newton told us, but it really never goes away. So what you have to really look at is what's called um, the energy equation how much kinetic energy you have of, of motion, the random motion of stars or your rotational speeds compared to what we call gravitational potential energy, how close together the masses are. And when those two are in balance, it's technically called the virial theorem, but it's no, nothing more than saying, if the kinetic energy is more than the gravitational binding energy, it'll fly apart. So that's, that's really what we mean when we say it ends by gravity. It's not, gravity is not going away. It's just that the kinetic energy is so much more than the gravitational binding because you're far away, if that helps. So it's still spinning around its own galaxy, not affecting by ours. Right? Yeah. The whole mass is... Andromeda is several trillion and we're one and a half trillion and we're going together. The whole local group, you add it all up, it's I think around four or four and a half trillion solar masses. So we're really all falling into one big supergroup, and in five billion years or more, after we pass through each other and slosh around, splash back, uh, we're going to be one big uh, amorphous group, one way over on the other side. So, so this is a typical headline of an article I've been reading over the past few days, I'd like you to comment on it. Image of Milky Way's black hole mocks new era in space science. Can you yeah. explain the significance? Could you go that? back to the fourth or fifth slide? Are you with the newspaper? No. Oh, okay. I want. I always want to be careful, you know. No. <laughs> um, yeah. The, uh, while you're setting it up. The, the headline came from what's called the Event Horizon Telescope. And uh, if they said it was space astronomy, that's incorrect. Space science. Well, they said space science. Oh, we we're studying space, okay. The telescopes were all on the ground, was the point I wanted to make. Those were radio telescopes all linked together in what's called aperture synthesis, like the Very Large Array down in New Mexico, and there's others around the world. And what they did was, uh, through the long baselines, um, be able to see that object. Now, I showed it earlier in my talk. This is the, uh, the radio emission around the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, black holes down here. This is gas swirling around it on its way in, but emitting radio emission and also X-rays. Um, I think what they're talking about has, has to do with how many different fields now are, are merging together to study these things. Radio astronomers are linking together all their telescopes to make this event horizon telescope. But si similarly, uh, 
there's gravitational wave detectors. There's now three, soon to be four, uh, that detected gravitational radiation from merging black holes. Um, not supermassive ones like this, but, but ones that were 30, 40 times the mass of our sun. They hope in the future to have a gravitational wave antenna in space called LISA, L-I-S-A, Laser Interferometric Space Antenna. Uh, it will have the right frequency to detect binary black holes of supermassive variety. And then at the same time, you'd like to observe them in the X-ray as, as they did with one of these LIGO gravitational wave events. When the, when the stars merged, they made what's called a kilonova, uh, not a supernova, but something, a very big explosion. Uh, and that was observed in the optical and infrared and, and could be in X-rays and gamma rays. So we're seeing multi-messenger astronomy where gravitational waves and optical and X-ray and, and uh, maybe someday neutrinos all can be observed from these explosive events. So that's probably what they're talking about when they say studying space. It's bringing together the whole electromagnetic spectrum plus gravitational waves plus these ethereal neutrinos that get produced in supernova explosions. And over the next 10, 20 years, I think we'll see it. Uh, so you said with the whale, like that whale galaxy that like formed together, that they cloud. The whale is in a small group of galaxies, yes. Like you said, how they were uh, one like slightly uh, spiral and slightly elliptical. Would it like condense into one or the other, or does it just stay that way? Well, remember, spiral galaxies. They're, first, they're they're full of gas, and the gas is rotating around in a disk. Think about a record platter. People have records anymore. <laughs> My son is bringing back vinyl. Anyway, you think about a record platter, and, and the motions are all in in that plane. Whereas if, if you collide them, now those stars are going to get kicked out of their neat circular orbits and get kicked out into space. And it's, it's tempting to say, well, if a passing star came by our solar system, the same thing might happen. Our, our solar system, Earth, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, go flying off. They'd get a gravitational kick and fly off into space. That would change how the galaxy looks. It would no longer look disk-like or spiral-like. It would puff up and look more elliptical. But more important, uh, it might strip out the gas when you collide. The, the shock waves might, might strip out the gas. That gas is the lifeblood of the galaxy. Without gas, no new stars. So that would quench the galaxy, we call it, stop the star formation rate. And in a few hundred million years, the galaxy would no longer look beautiful blue spiral waves. It would look red and dead. So that's, that's galactic evolution uh, triggered by collisions. Do you have any online? I have you. Okay. I thought my brother for sure would have one for me. He's, he was gonna call in from Portland. <laughs> Is there a question? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Three hours earlier. This is a, probably a simpleton question, but a couple. Um, the galactic center, what is it composed of that makes it yeah. so bright? Yeah. Well, um, if, you, if, if you think, we're, we're not a hurricane, but if you think about a hurricane <laughs> with gas clouds swirling around, the, the center, the eye of the hurricane um, is it, very quiescent. Uh, I've never been in a hurricane. I hope not. Well, actually, I have my first year here, but not in the, not in the eye of the hurricane. But at the center of the galaxy, it's not quiescent. It's, it's very strong gravity. The tidal effects are very strong. Um, it's where gas ends up falling for a lot of reasons. Uh, that bar in the barred spiral that I showed, that, that is a conduit for gas straight down to the center. And if there's a black hole waiting there to get fed, um, it can flare up. Right now, our, our black hole is pretty quiet. Uh, black holes are fussy eaters. Sometimes they don't eat, but sometimes they gorge. And when they gorge and flare up, then they can blow out jets and winds and do a lot of damage. But right now, the galactic center is full of, of star clusters that have fallen in and a lot of very dense gas clouds that have been channeled in along that bar. And the next time it flares up, the black hole, 
uh, it's going to get very, uh, very interesting. I don't know if it'll happen in our lifetime, but it will happen. Uh, they, f they flare on, I don't know, thousands of years time scales. Yeah. In the back over here. Do we know if the axis of rotation of the uh, Milky Way's uh, supermassive black hole is aligned with the axis of rotation of the galaxy? Uh, that's a great question. And the answer is no, not yet. Uh, we have no way of, of really measuring the spin other than to look at these images. Well, it's gone away. And if you interpret the ellipse, both of the one in Sagittarius in our Milky Way or in M87, if you interpret the ellipse as saying, well, it's really a circle, and so it's tilted and it looks elliptical. That could give you a hint that, that it would be slightly misaligned. I suspect it is. It all depends on how you feed it. You know, the spin comes from matter that you throw in and rotates around and, and uh, whatever, whatever formed the black hole has a memory of what fell into it and it's angular momentum. So probably it's misaligned. I think we are ending the hour by uh, not gravity or gas, but by fatigue. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I actually questions. have one other question, if you don't mind. Um, oh, sorry. There was, on one of your slides, you had um, the, the, I think, the graph of uh, velocities. The rotation curve of the Milky Way. Exactly. Right. And I was trying to understand, would that be that we would expect those velocities to actually have kind of a downward slope the entire yeah, I, I, I pointed to it with my hands and, oh, great. I think you just passed it, go back. Couple more, there you go. Okay, so this is the so-called flat. It's, it's declining a little bit. Yeah, keep your hand off the trigger. <laughs> I know, I, I'm with you. Um, this, this is almost constant up at about 220. 240 kilometers a second. If this obeyed Kepler's law, which is how our solar system works, or Kepler's law says if you've got a point mass like the sun or the dominant mass uh, in the center, this velocity would fall off as one over the square root of R. That's Kepler's law, like, like the planets in the solar system. And that can be ruled out. So Vera Rubin saw that immediately when she saw not our Milky Way, but other galaxies having flat rotation curves out as far as she could measure. And she said, oh, something must be binding it together. Um, 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier, Fritz Zwicky, an astronomer at Caltech, found the same effect with clusters of galaxies, that the, the motions of galaxies in the coma cluster were too high. And if there weren't dark matter, he, he invented the term dark matter, not in English, but in uh, German. And if you didn't have it, those galaxies would go flying off into space. So unless gravity is not what Newton and Einstein told us, there must be something dark and, and binding the Milky Way together. Too bad it's invisible. I hope someday we can find a way to see it other than feeling its gravity. Last one? Okay, I'm sure there's donuts. Any we're gonna have, we're gonna have our, our, a break. So if you have other questions, yeah, I'll stick around. Sure. Yeah.